during the course of filming Lifeboat, which, you know, covered rescue operations in the Mediterranean off the coast of Libya. In the first three days of that rescue mission, um, you know, we came upon over 3,000 people, asylum seekers, floating in flimsy rafts in the water. And we were on the Zodiacs, and um, we were filming. And within the first couple hours, you know, we would come up to these rafts and these boats that were in really dire shape, and people would be pushed off, and people would jump off, and people would fall into the water. And um, some of them couldn't swim. And so we found ourselves in this moment where we had a choice. We could film someone drown in front of us, or we could put our cameras down and pull them out of the water. And so that's what we did. We put our cameras in the bottom of the Zodiac and just started pulling people out of the water. And, um, you know, if I was Wiseman, right, according to his paradigm, then we should have just filmed. And... um, I didn't anticipate that moment beforehand. I had no sort of foreknowledge that I was going to find myself faced with that dilemma of the moment as a documentarian. But there was no question in my mind that I had to put my camera down and pull that fellow human being out of the water. And I don't regret it at all. So I've come to a different place. I've evolved to what I believe for the kind of film that I do is more appropriate, right? Like I I can go to sleep at night knowing that Regardless of how the film would have been different if I hadn't made that choice, I made the right choice as a human being. So I, I think of it as a, being a human being first and a filmmaker second in moments like that. That's beautifully, beautifully put. But I also think like you could be a human being in small ways too, like silly ways, and put a little bit of yourself in in, in documentaries. I, I tend to see that as really beautiful, like when like the meta piece of it. Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Just just put yourself into the yeah. into the movie a little bit, because um, like break that third, fourth, whatever the wall is, yeah. is realize that there's a human behind the camera too. For some reason, me as a fan, as a viewer, that's enjoyable too. I think there's a real authenticity there behind the story, especially with these hard stories that you're doing. That there's a human being struggling too, mm. like. Uh, observing the suffering and having to bear the burden that this kind of suffering exists in the world and you're behind that camera living that struggle. And there's small ways to show yourself in that way. As you know, I I don't do that in a big way. But, you know, I actually, there are subtle moments where I allow that presence to live just for a second. Like, like, I hate belly button docks. That's what I call them. I don't know. What's, what, what's a belly button? A belly button dock is navel gazing, right? Where <laughs> it's sort of a narcissistic filmmaking where someone just studies their own place in the world, right? I, I think. I see. Yeah. 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 I, th- I, th- I think my, you know, or I, I'm more concerned with how I can intervene, right? Yeah. Um, well, you're trying to really deeply empathize. Yeah. So, like, if you deeply empathize, who, who am I? I don't want to center myself in these stories. It's not about me, right? I am so unimportant. What is important is what's happening, what's unfolding in the world that we need to act upon, hmm. and right. And I think it's selfish and narcissistic to to you know push myself into these stories unnecessarily. Now that said, I think there is some small value in what you're saying, just to remind viewers that there's obviously a filmmaker at play. So sometimes the way that I do that is just like through a question on camera. I'd all allow the audio to live of a question or during a conversation I'm having with someone so they can they can just hear how it's posed, for example, right? And to me, that's enough. Yeah. I, I do like moments when people recognize that you exist. They, they look p- at the filmmaker past the camera and but yeah, it's, you ask the question in an interview or something like that, and they respond to that. Yeah, uh, like they respond to this like new perturbation into their reality that was created by this other human. Yeah, and I especially like when those questions or those uh, perturbations are like a little bit absurd mm-hmm. and like 
add something very novel to their situation, and that novelty reveals something about them. Mm. Uh, so as opposed to capturing the day-to-day -day reality of their life, you do that plus the perturbations of like something novel. Yeah. That, and, but of course, there's 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 all kinds of ways to do this. Let me. Um, what was number five, by the way? Only I only gave you four. You get, you just I'm you gonna stay at four. The, there's a short doc I like. I mentioned they're called the Toxic Pigs of Fukushima. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I apologize. I know, I know. It's dark. It's a great it's title, dark. though, right? It's a great title. Yeah, a great title. It's it's. No one's seen it, but it's great. Uh, it's it says what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly what it sounds like, but really brilliantly executed. Well, let me ask you about Lifebook because it's extremely. I, I don't. Um, it's a really moving. Um, idea uh, just just the fact that this exists in the world that there's um the, as a metaphor as a reality that there is a set of people trying to flee desperately is the desperation of it and now with his refugees the desperation of that of of trying to escape towards a world that full of mystery uncertainty uh doubt could be hopeless at times and you're willing to do a lot for your own survival and for the survival of your family and all those kinds of things. That's kind of the, the human spirit. And you just capture it um, in Lifeboat. Can you tell me the, the story behind this film as you started to already tell? Um, can you tell me what is it about? So Lifeboat um, really seeks to sort of lift up and showcase the asylum seeker uh, crisis in the Mediterranean when it was at its height um, in 2016. And um, it came to be for many reasons, but, but one of those reasons is, is um, colleagues in the NGO community really shared with me that um, when the borders between Greece and Turkey were shut down, that the, the flow of a Syrian um, asylum seekers that was initially going across from Turkey to Greece was going to shift westward across the Mediterranean. So I started to research that and discovered that was exactly the case. And then further stumbled upon the fact that um, nation states hadn't really stepped up to address it and that there were hundreds of asylum seekers often drowning in these flimsy crafts that were pushed off from the shores of Libya because the EU wasn't doing its duty to um, patrol those waters from a humanitarian standpoint. And so the net result of that was that this whole sort of like humanitarian community sprung up um, and it was civil society based that that tried to meet the needs of those asylum seekers to, to just ensure that fellow human beings weren't drowning, simply put. And one of those was this small little NGO called Sea Watch, which when they discovered what was happening, just cobbled together a coalition of, of um, volunteers, bought a research vessel, retrofitted it, and um, motored down off the coast of Libya to start pulling people out of the water. And again, I found that inspiring, right? I found that inspiring that this group of volunteers was doing something that our leaders wouldn't, right? And it was something as basic and simple as saving human beings. Um, and um, I thought there was an inspiring story there. And as it turned out, there was. Have you ever saved someone's life? As, as, a, as part of making these documentaries directly? And directly, I think you probably have countless lives, but directly. Were you put in that position? I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. I mean, I certainly poured people out of the water who couldn't swim. I did that. And that's, again, speaking to the basic humanity. Put down the camera and help. Yeah. Uh, so this is people coming from Libya, yeah. trying to make it across the Mediterranean Sea on a crappy, tiny boat. From a filmmaker perspective, how do you film that? Was there decisions to, to capture the desperation? Well, we were, you know, we were uh, going back to this idea of access and how that's so fundamental to my approach. Um, 
you know, we we were bound by the strictures of the rescue operation on this Sea Watch vessel, which was thirty meters long, and we were two of a crew of fifteen. Right, so we had to multitask all the time because the only reason we were on that boat was by agreeing that if needed, we would do whatever necessary, right, to um, to help, right. And so it was very active on multiple levels, and and um, we were making decisions each and every day that were um, not only filmmaking and creative decisions, but also just dis- decisions about. Um, how how to um, live that duality, right, of being a humanitarian and a filmmaker simultaneously. And uh, the greatest example I can share of that was well, with my director of photography in that project, Kenny Allen. He, um, Kenny's a big guy. It's like, he's got like arms like tree trunks and... Um, and he, because he was so physically able and strong, the head of mission um, really tasked him to be on the Zodiacs to pull people out of the water because he could literally, with one arm, reach down and just oftentimes pull someone out, right? Um, whereas usually it would take two or three people, right? And so when we were at the height of triage and there were people in the water all over and rafts were sinking, um, Kenny was out pulling people out of the water. And this went on for like Great. 24 hours, right? And at yeah. the end of that first day, I remember like looking over on the deck and seeing Kenny like help people up from the ladders to walk them back, right? And his camera was nowhere to be seen, yeah. right? And so I walked over to him and I just grabbed him by the shoulders and said, Kenny, where's your camera? And he didn't know. He had no idea where his camera was, right? And so I just said, Kenny, we're here to do what you're doing, but we're also here to film it, right? To make sure that we document what is unfolding in front of us so that we have a record of it, right? So we can bring it to a larger audience. So you need to go find your camera so we can also document it. Yeah. And that kind of pulled him out and he went and got his camera and started filming again. But but that gives you a sense of sort of this world that we had to live in in order to get the story done. But I think to be a great director of photography, to be a great director, you have to lose yourself like that in the story too. But usually with a camera in your hand, right? But sometimes you forget the camera. I mean, like the, the, there's a, I feel like if you're obsessed with the camera too much, mm. you can lose the humanity of it. You get obsessed with the film and the story. It can become clinical. Yes, it can yeah, become Yeah, absolutely, clinical. and it's, it's you know, I yeah, absolutely. And and we don't want to become, we, I don't want to become clinical in my films, certainly. 